precious Holy Spirit, as Jesus promised, please guide us into all truth. Amen. Well, my dear heart dwellers, there is a doctrine circulating that a soul can be redeemed from hell. Some even assert that they can descend into hell and remove a soul with their own efforts, sacrifices, and fasts. Dear heart dwellers, I have tried very hard before to open up this point of discernment to you that is so very important. Sometimes those with the charismatic gifts and the gift of healing can minister in an area because it's given to them by God. Some are even able to be transported in the spirit to minister, even as Philip was. But that is no proof that their doctrine is sound. The Satanists also have the ability to travel in the spirit and appear in different places. Some of us also can do this, but we don't discuss it. The point is that the ardent desire and love we have for a soul can actually cause the Lord to place us beside them when they're far away so we can minister to them. This is now becoming commonplace with deeply committed Christians. What does this ability tell us? That they know the scriptures and can edit them to their own ideas? That they have the mind of Christ and can teach truth? That their ability to heal makes them equal with God in their interpretation of scripture? Certainly not. It does indicate a deep love for others if the gift is authentic, and it is truly the Lord placing them at the bedside of the sick. The demons are able to replicate visions of you and me and make people think I was in a specific place with them ministering. All they have to do is project an image of me to a person with spiritual sight, and that's what they will see, a projected image of me or you and they will believe it's true. I am not discounting anyone's gift. I am merely stating a fact. If it can be fabricated, the enemy will use it. So we are not to replace the scriptures with the opinion or interpretation of man when it goes directly against sound and proven doctrine as it is set forth in the scriptures. But with any impressive or charismatic gift, also comes the responsibility not to overstep boundaries and take it upon themselves to go against the pastor's teachings and leadership with his flock. I am bringing this to you because there's a heresy circulating in Christian circles that people can be saved from hell, that hell is not eternal punishment, and God's mercy will in the end rescue souls from hell. This is the teaching. I would ask you to look into the scriptures for yourself and see who said that hell was eternal torment and weigh their word against the words of those who are teaching a new and strange doctrine. The Lord warns us through Paul's writings, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be under a divine curse as we have said before, so now I say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you embraced, let him be under a divine curse. That's Galatians 1.9. You see, all kinds of heresy was circulating in Paul's time, and he was constantly having to defend the truth. And now is not any difference. In fact, the Lord promised that at the end of the age there would be deceivers. So as far as the curse Paul pronounced goes, I think that's a bit harsh for a person who is ignorant of what the scriptures say and is just spouting their own opinion. They should be corrected in charity first. And if they continue to undermine the scriptures, then stronger measures should be taken, such as not allowing them to teach error. Why is this declaration of Paul's so adamant and strong? 
because the salvation of souls and their faith in God hinge on what is written in the scriptures. If you meddle with the doctrines such as eternal suffering, you may be giving license to sinners to keep sinning until God delivers them at the end of the age and they get to go to heaven. By teaching this law, you will be held responsible for their eternal souls. You know, because some people are going to interpret it. Well, okay, well, this is so pleasurable and I'm enjoying myself so much. Sooner or later... Yeah, I might go to hell for a while, but the Lord will pull me out. The other issue you're dealing with is that if you can prove one part of Scripture wrong, then all of it can be proven wrong. It's either God's inerrant word or a metaphor to be interpreted as you will. From the scientific community has been the continual effort to erode the very basis of the Bible the book of Genesis. Of course, if Genesis and the creation narrative can be discredited as a fable, if Noah's ark can be discredited as a fable, then Jesus Christ is also just another fable, and anything goes, from him marrying a former prostitute to not rising from the dead. The devils are very clever, guys, and know just how our thought processes work, and how we pride ourselves on our intelligence. They know how to appeal to the intellect and what arguments will work and what will not work. And so they have set the entire university and scientific community against Christianity and the teaching of the scriptures to the point where they're turning out hundreds of thousands of secular humanists. Which, by the way, if you research the tenets of the Church of Satan, you will find they are identical to secular humanism. Wow, that's certainly no surprise. There are probably 20 or more references to the eternal torments of hell. Most of them are spoken directly by Jesus. And what I want to present to you is that Jesus told us we would have eternal life. The word he used was the very same word he used to describe eternal torment. So here you can see the devil himself is twisting concepts of God's mercy to undermine the word of God and the teachings of Jesus. Strike one. Next, the enemy will present his own doctrine and be insinuating that we're a lower form of life than the tall white demon aliens and that God the Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit are just their chief spirits on a mission from their planet, missionaries sent to populate the earth. And there's no such thing as eternal life, only life until the tall white God has fulfilled his purpose on earth, and then the thing the Christians call the New Jerusalem is just one of the mega spaceships that will remove all souls, and they'll cease to be because their mission on earth is completed. And all the promises in Revelation are just metaphors that make sense and give hope to earthlings. Strike two. Therefore, we on earth are to worship this tall white God and pay him homage that he might spare the souls of earth at the judgment and allow them to continue populating the earth, showing his infinite mercy rather than annihilating the earth and all souls in it. Strike three. And bingo, your faith has just been devoured. Please, if you consider yourself the elect, do not toy with doctrines of demons. Jesus said the evil ones would be punished for eternity. And in the next breath also said we would have eternal life and eternity of bliss in heaven using the same word for eternal. And here are a few scriptures that point out this. Matthew 25, Jesus said, Depart from me, you accursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor, to gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's Matthew 3.12. 
Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That's Matthew 25, 46. So shall the glory of the righteous have an end? For the same word is used to express the duration of punishment. And then these words, kolasin eonin, is used to express the duration of a state of glory. And zoan eonin is also the same word used to express the duration of the agony in hell. Further scripture says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That's Revelation 2014. The Lord doesn't leave us hanging as to what will transpire at the end of the age. In the final judgment, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone was found whose name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And that's Revelation 20. Where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. And that's in Mark 9.46. But here's Jesus saying the word never. Now, if you ignore this and ignore the meaning of never, you can also ignore his other promise which says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So you see, all you have to do is twist one thing into a lie and you can turn the whole scriptures upside down to suit whatever fancies you. And here again, Jesus told this parable about the beggar Lazarus and the rich man who wanted his relatives to be warned about hell. In the midst of a sentence, the Lord stated, Between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. That's in Luke 16:26. And I want to remind you that in near-death experiences before a soul is permanently condemned to hell, if he cries out to the Lord, sometimes the Lord snatches him right out of the jaws of hell. But we're not talking about that. And the heresy that's being propagated here is that you can spend the next 500 years in hell until the end of the world or whatever, and at the end times, the Lord will snatch you out of hell and restore you. Later on in scriptures, it says, A time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. That's John 5.28. So this strange doctrine about hell says that in the end, the evil souls will have the same reward as the just souls. Later on in Mark 9.43, if your hand causes you to fall into sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two hands and go into hell, into the unquenchable fire. The Lord here says that the fire is unquenchable. That means it will never cease to burn. In conclusion, I ask you all to please seek the Lord about his word and make a conscious decision not to follow any charismatic souls that preach another gospel. Rather, I would ask you to correct them in charity and love. If such a one is in grave error in this area, I think it's safe to assume that there are other doctrinal errors as well. Pray for them, but be very vigilant not to swallow anything they say, especially if it conflicts with the Lord's very own words. I mean, after all, who are we to believe? A man or the Lord who has proven himself 
extremely trustworthy when it comes to his word. So at this point, I pretty much finished what I wanted to say, and I asked the Lord Jesus, is there anything you want to say? He began, thank you for addressing this, Claire. There are many interpretations of my life and words that are not in line with my character or what I taught. Many are the well-meaning individuals who believe that presenting me as so merciful that I cannot condemn liars and evildoers to hell because I'm just too loving. Dear ones, do you know that it is not only I who condemn to hell in a very real sense? Rather, it is the soul who condemns himself or herself by her free will choices. What is not understood is that the majority of these souls would be tormented beyond measure if they were taken to heaven. They would curse and defile with their words everything holy until they were removed from that pristine environment. They have spent their lives doing evil, and the very thought of love or holiness sends them into an uncontrolled frenzy of hatred until they're restored to the devil's domain. When a soul spends their life doing evil, they have bent themselves into corruption so far that even if you were to grant their request to go to heaven, they would quickly recant and want to be returned to the evil domain. And I want to take an aside here. I don't remember which uh, saint or Christian it was. I think it was uh, St. Teresa Little Flower. But one of the saints had asked the Lord permission to deliver someone from hell. And the Lord gave her permission. And she was taken to hell and pulled the soul out and took them to heaven. And that's exactly what they did. They cursed, they kicked and screamed, and they went wild until they were returned to hell. They didn't want to be in heaven. That was their choice. And then she understood later, wow, some people just don't want to be in heaven. And please, don't take this example as license for us to go to hell and pull people out. The Lord was just trying to illustrate to her how corrupted the heart of a soul in hell truly is, so that she wouldn't be so grieved when she sees people going to hell. She wanted to extend mercy. But it had to be revealed to her that the inner man was already so corrupted that they would never be happy in heaven. So this is not an example to confirm that you can go to hell and save people or that hell is finite. No, rather it's an example of the Lord teaching a soul. This is what really transpires in one who has been condemned to hell. The Lord continued, Yes, I am the one, in a very real sense, that determines their afterlife. But what you don't see is the bent of a soul, even one crying out for mercy on the surface. What lies beneath is another story. There are many false but plausible doctrines being presented at this time. As I told you, the church would be apostate. Many false doctrines. Again, I ask of you, be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Claire has presented many unseen concepts to you, but every single one is backed by my word or my actions in my life. I would never ask you to agree with or believe anything totally opposite of what I taught. Be careful, loved ones. Be careful of lying signs and wonders that can accompany those who have been chosen by Satan to deceive and divide. These are going to proliferate during the end times, and if you're lazy and unfamiliar with the scriptures, you may end up captive and be stripped clean of your faith in me. Accept nothing at face value just because there are attesting miracles. I have warned you of this in advance. Please, See to it that you pay heed. And at that point, I remembered there was a scripture about that, and I looked it up, and this is what he said. 
for false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders that would deceive even the elect if that were possible. I have told you in advance. And that's Matthew 24. You know, I thought, I hope my personality is not getting in here, Lord, and I'm trying to defend myself and what I'm teaching. I hope this is you and not me uh, who's giving me this message, this latter half. And I read the words, I have told you in advance. I had no way of knowing that, but I looked again at my sentence preceding this one, where the Lord said, Accept nothing in the sentence proceeding, accept nothing at face value because there are testing miracles. I have warned you of this in advance. Please see to it that you pay heed. That phrase, I've warned you in advance, that had to be the Lord because I wasn't expecting that. And I just wrote it down as I heard it and I turn around and look for the scripture and he used the very same words in Matthew twenty-four, twenty-five. That gave me some confidence that it truly was the Lord and not just me going on a rant. The Lord continued here, I have left you with the spirit of truth. He will lead and guide you into all truth, just as I promised. If you listen very carefully and examine my words to you, I pray the spirit of lies will not be able to devour your faith and that you may stand in these last days and be found innocent and without error, having defended the truth in courage and righteousness. I have not left you on your own. We are with you, even to the end of the age. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are collected and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom every cause of sin and all who practice lawlessness and they will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew thirteen forty one. So you see, the Lord talks a great deal about hell. Jesus speaks more about hell than anyone else in the Bible. So to go against what he's taught about hell is to go against him. Discredit just one doctrine, and you can discredit them all. Please, dear heart dwellers, let's be so very vigilant over our hearts and our minds and not allow anything to be sown into us that is false. God bless you all and may the spirit of truth always have the victory in our hearts and minds and lives. Amen.